extremely happy to start the new year with uh, Michael Shuchak. Uh, all of you know Michael, so there's absolutely no need for me to introduce you because you came to hear him, not me. Uh, just a few things. Uh, if uh, you have a phone, put it on silent. Uh, and that's one thing. More importantly, if you're not on our mailing list, give us a business card and we'll add you to it. And much, much more importantly, uh, these events, as you know, are free. It's our policy to offer this to the community. But the fact they are free does not preclude uh, <coughs> making a contribution. Uh, and uh, we have uh, two boxes there. Uh, the, the gentleman with tattoos will come by to, uh, to explain to you the donation process. Uh, some of them don't speak English very well, but I'm sure the body language will help you understand. <laughs> so thank you again. Thank you, Michael. As always, it is a tremendous honor to be the first speaker of the year at these Temple University events. Uh, I enjoy them very much. I unfortunately can't attend enough of them. But if you are free in the evenings, there are going to be a series of fabulous talks by incredibly smart people this year. And uh, it, I hope that will make up for what you're about to hear this evening. Uh, this is the third year in a row that I've done this. and. Uh, Luckily, I've had a wonderful subject, and that subject, of course, is Mr. Shinzo Abe. Abe Shinzo. Uh, he is always entertaining, uh, always uh, surprising, and certainly always uh, worth talking about. And uh, he certainly surprised us at the end of last year with his SNAP election. Uh, some people may, during Q&A, say, I knew he was going to have an election. Well, why didn't you call me and tell me this was going to happen? I was very much surprised. It certainly did not feature in any way in my speech of a year ago, uh, on the 16th, I believe it was, of January. Or maybe it was earlier, but it was the 19th, it was a full year ago. Anyway, political outlook for 2015. There are some just basic dates in the immediate future that everyone should be uh, familiar with. If you're sitting in the back row and you can't sit, to see, I'm sorry. Uh, this is designed for people in the front row and in the front, and people sitting toward the front, so if you need to see. Then maybe, the, yeah, if you turn off the lights, that would be nice. Um, basically, we have a series of political events that are closed. Uh, this weekend, we have the Saga gubernatorial election, which uh, will determine uh, whether Abe in his the most recent gov election for governorships goes two for two, or two out, I mean, it goes two wins and two losses, or uh, one win, which was Fukushima, and three losses for his party. Uh, which, at the end of, before the election was called last year, looked kind of important, but now doesn't seem quite so. Uh, we have on the 14th the finalization of the budget, which was delayed, only what happens in, in December but uh, it will be in January because we have the election. And then Abe, uh, two days later, goes for a tour where he'll be going uh, to the Palestinian Authority, to Israel, to Egypt, and to Jordan. Uh, this is really his first foray into the Middle East in a big way. Uh, he's been all around the world, and the Middle East and uh, East Asia have been the two places where he has made uh, the least, or, uh, where he has not made what the um, Japanese Prime Ministers usually uh, make as destinations. And then on the 18th, we have the DPJ leadership election. You'll find out who his uh, opponent is. Uh, in the most recent election, the DPJ didn't do as well as many people had hoped, and the, uh, the uh, Innovation Party, the Ishinoto, did much better, so that those two parties have both have rights to call themselves major opposition parties. But for most people in the country, the DPJ is the opposition party. And frankly, Abe Shinzo has not had, in the past uh, two years, in the person of Kaida Bandi, an opponent worthy of a prime minister. Uh, Kaida is a very intelligent, erudite man, author of about 100 books uh, altogether. Uh, Quotes Chinese poetry every week, 
but in terms of being a leader of a major political party, it was a complete disaster. Uh, I have my theories about why that was so, and what's the outlook for the three men, and unfortunately it is the three men who are running for the DPJ uh, leadership position. Uh, but I'll talk about that later. This is, I'll try to concentrate on Mr. Abe. Uh, then after that, the Yamanashi gubernatorial election, um, the regular session of the Diet, and uh, the really important date, however, for this or in the immediate future are the April 12th and April 26th uh, unified local elections. These loomed huge in the fall of last year and basically uh, dominated everyone's thinking about the way Abe Shinzo would be ruling the country for the first months of this year, uh, seeing as though the performance of the LDP in these elections would be the basic criteria upon which Abe Shinzo would be judged in the elections that happen later on the next page in September for the presidency of the LDP. That is no longer the case, but uh, the local elections are seen as very much unimportant after you win a national election <coughs> the way that they did in, the, in December. This, these local elections are uh, are not important for the LDP presidential election in the way that they were. Nevertheless, it would be nice if the LDP performed well in these elections, and certainly in terms of policy, and that's one of the things that I'm going to be focusing on this evening, in terms of policy, these elections loom very large. And then we come to more problematic issues in the, in the future. Uh, in May, there are going to be both the uh, start of committee hearings on the new defense guidelines or the new defense uh, law revisions that have to be done to put into place the collective security decision made on July the 1st of last year. Now, there are about 15 laws that have to be amended, and all of these amendments will have to be discussed, and, there will be and at least the opposition parties intend on it revisiting all of the arguments that were made last year in the build-up to the collective security uh, decision. They know very well that the public is not supportive of the way that the government conducted itself. And uh, they also know that um, about at least half of the people do not think that the decision was correct. So the latest Nikkei polls gave 48% as people who do not see that, that the collective security decision was the correct one. Now, uh, at the same time, a really huge issue which has to be dealt with after the local elections is a finalization of a plan for agricultural reform. We have right now JA, Japan Agriculture, fighting furiously, uh, and basically a guerrilla war with the Abe administration as regards reforming the entire agricultural system of Japan. JA has to take a huge hit for Japan to be able to do anything in terms of trade negotiations on a, on a global, on a multilateral level, or even on a bilateral level. Uh, in order to do that, something has to be built that will replace JA and its vast tentacles of influence throughout society. That fight is in, in going to be in May, and then in June, uh, we're going to have the most likely uh, final agreement with uh, the local authorities of Fukui Prefecture and Shiga Prefecture uh, regarding uh, the Takahama nuclear power station. Uh, basically, that's a given uh, because the communities that surround the nuclear power plants are dependent on the power plants. The prefectural assemblies, at least let's say in this case the Takahama is Fukui, uh, at least 70% LDP representatives in the assemblies. It's a given, but nevertheless, there's going to be a lot of talk and a lot of discussion and a lot of uh, massaging and hand-holding and maybe a few budget allocations. Coming up in the rest of this, this year, uh, we come also in June to what will be the third attempt to create a globally acceptable and understandable and implementable third arrow reforms package. 
Uh, they've tried twice so far, both times, the domestic response and the international response has been, uh, what is that? Uh, the first year was, was, sh it was short, the next year it was 230 items. Goodness knows what it's going to be this year. Uh, one would hope uh, in the aftermath of the election that it will be a very seriously thought out uh, product after two product failures. We'll have to see what, what's going to happen there. And I'll get to visit this particular item a little bit later in this talk. Uh, finally, what's probably the, the ultimate moment of the year for Abishinzo will be August 15th the 70th anniversary of World War II, where he will issue the Abe Statement, the Abe Danwa, which will have a forward-looking view on relations of Japan to the world, <coughs> Japan to East Asia, and Japan in terms of its role in the world as a military political power. Uh, the uh, people who are seconded to the Conte from the various ministries, particularly the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, are already in a tizzy about this one. They really are already working, it's obvious, and they're working on the wording now, and they're trying to figure out what it is that the Danwa is going to say. Well, and how this is going to be an excruciating process and a fascinating process, likely for Abe personally, because he sees himself as a, as a now as a historical actor, having won this re-election uh, and he's, he's won three elections in a, in a row. It's, he's got a great record as an LDP leader and an LDP uh, person, and a, as, a, uh, as a prime minister. That 70th anniversary uh, is going to be fraught, and Mr. Abe has to be very careful in the build-up to that, in terms of the language and the body language that he uses, uh, the actions that he takes, uh, they, they will be scrutinized, particularly by, of course, Chinese and South Koreans, but also the whole world, for indications as to where he wishes to take Japan politically, and more importantly, militarily. And then we have some minor things. We have the, the, the November, uh, another tour, grand tour of the world, like it did this past November, prior to the announcing the election and the compilation of the budget. Farther out in 2016, we have, in the middle of the year, the House of Councilors election. This is a crucial election for the DPJ. Everything that they're doing now in terms of this January 18th election is thinking about how do we hold on to our seats and hold on to our role in, in Japanese politics in the House of Councils election, Mr. Abe, of course, has the, the counter goal, how do I squash the DPJ, how do I take seats back, and how do I establish the LDP as simply an overwhelming power in Japanese politics. That's going to be a crucial issue, even this year, is building towards the House of Councils election, where if indeed the LDP uh, increases its, its seats to totals, and it's very likely to, given the current political environment, uh, that Abe Shinzo and his, his people will have even greater latitude uh, to, to act on the political military side of, of the uh, equation. And then the next year, uh, Mr. Abe has already delayed the, ri the rising of the consumption tax. It is supposed to go and in April from, of 2017, from 8% to 10%, we can assume, Japanese people being intelligent, that they will buy a lot of stuff before it goes up to 10%, and then the economy will collapse. This has happened twice now. If it doesn't happen three times, it would be a miracle. Uh, at which point, Mr. Abe will have to deal with, if he's still in power, will have to deal with the uh, sudden setback to Abenomics once again. And then uh, in 2018, now somehow I skipped over the LDP presidential election's importance, but if in 2018 he'll face the second LDP presidential election, currently LDP bylaws allow only two three-year terms, consecutive three-year terms. 
Um, Mr. Abe will have fulfilled those, that, uh, those three year terms and ostensibly cannot run again. Of course, he has partisans within the party who are drumming up support for him being the prime minister in power when the Olympics are held in 2020 here in Tokyo. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, that it would be, first of all, putting off uh, rivals in, in the party year after year after year after year, and that's just not something that's likely. And I'm pretty sure the Japanese public will be absolutely sick to death of Abe Shinzo by that time. Uh, this is the list of the longest lasting uh, prime ministers. And as you can see, Abe Shinzo is already way up there. Uh, the, uh, of course, his uh, great uncle, Sato Esaku, uh, is way ahead. And Yoshida Shigeru with, with his many ins and outs of politics. Koizumi uh, got surpassed Nakasone. Hayato Ikeda in 1109 as of today. Uh, is Abe Shinzo. That's all of his, his time, including his 2006 2007 stint. Uh, he, he'll get, he'll be, you know, historically he'll be in fifth place, not, not so far in the future. But for him to challenge any of the, to the top two uh, is far fetched. Uh, and I'll go into that if people want to, to talk about that, or I'd like to hear your thoughts about that. But nevertheless, Abe Shinzo, as he is right now, is one of the longest serving prime ministers ever and should be recognized for, uh, for that achievement. And, uh, for the, because, and I say that because there are many people who still uh, look upon him as something of a lightweight, uh, not historically, he isn't. Um, and that to hammer this home, this is the graph that I show. Um, I, of course, he's been in, in power 24 months, but I, I have a certain emotional reaction to this. I've stopped at 22 because uh, Obuchi uh, passes away at this point, and I don't think it's fair that, that Abe is competing against the man who died in office. But in general, uh, if you look at the stability of these numbers, not just their, how much higher they are than everyone else, and how much they continue past the, the one-year death point. Uh, the stability is astonishing uh, and ahistoric. And uh, given the, the current political situation, uh, this ahistorical pattern probably will continue. Uh, we don't have a situation yet and again, I'll go into that more later in detail, uh, why we don't have a situation where there would be the fluctuations that we even see in the career of the great Koizumi, who is the green, who is the green line here. So a, a huge start, and then a, a big drop, and up and down, and up and down. Abe is basically the flattest of them all. Uh, and that's really, really interesting in terms of Japanese political life, that you, you just stay the same. And currently, the numbers are right around 50% um, for Abe Shinzo, so it's, it's, it's just stayed stable. These are the NHK numbers. Other uh, people have, uh, other organizations have different numbers. Uh, UK is 51% support, I think, in the most recent poll. Uh, Yomiuri is 49%. But somewhere around the 50% line is absolutely aberrant in Japanese political history. Uh, and we just haven't seen that. And, but there's no outlook for any change. So <clears throat> what's going to happen this year? If, if I was asked to give a series of speeches before the election, and I thought of basically two scenarios. Uh, scenario here one, scenario two. The first one, uh, renewed vigor, is the one where Abe Shinzo, uh, having won in the election, but not overwhelmingly, again, the uh, LDP was projected by the, late, the last polls prior to the election to win as many as 300 seats. They didn't get anywhere close to that. They, in fact, lost a few seats. And in their coalition partner, the new Komeito gained seats, changing the power balance. 
ostensibly within the relationship between the new Komeito and, and uh, the LDP, uh, that this moment of, of mixed victory, being victorious but not as victorious as, as one had hoped, combined with the very poor economic numbers that we had in the last, in the fall of last year, uh, that these would stimulate him to think the economy is what's important, the world's view of Japan's uh, reform programs is important. Uh, these things have to be focused on. I'm going to focus on them, and I'll let all the other things slide. I've got my conservative bona fides. I don't have to patronize, or, or I don't have to pander, I'm sorry, pander to right-wing sensibilities. I don't have to do that. The second scenario I thought was, Abe Shinzo and his party win a big election victory. The clock starts over. They have four years to run the revolution, whether it's the economic revolution or the political revolution. Either way, they don't have to do anything. And so, they'll do what everybody does. They'll slack off. They'll take their time. Uh, the international uh, financial journalists will say, why aren't there more third era reforms? And they'll say, because they're hard, it's difficult. We have a difficult agricultural lobby. So, you know, our, our generic um, pharmaceuticals companies want to continue doing generics without paying American companies for the, the rights. And there, uh, there would be a time this year of slowing down. That was before the election. After the election, what I sense more is a third possible scenario, which I have perhaps unkindly called the enemy of the people uh, scenario, where Abe Shinzo and the people around him feel uh, that they are not understood by the people. They did not get the victory that they deserved. People did not show up at the polls that there is a great deal of misunderstanding and there's nothing we can do about it. I take this viewpoint because of the way that, for example, uh, Suga Yoshihide spoke to journalists at the FCCJ, I went to his press conference last year, uh, where he said, we don't care about the poll numbers. We do what's in our manifesto and we're going to keep our promises to the people. And this was even though, you know, the people don't want you to do that. They don't want you to restart the nuclear power plants or set up a, a, a nuclear power plant, a restart program that is rapid. They don't want you to do that. Why would you do that when they don't want you, when the public opinion polls are against it? Well, we don't care. And that is a potential scenario which I think is very likely in terms of security affairs and very likely in terms of, of the nuclear issue. Uh, the nuclear issue is mostly uh, quarantine because most issues have been dealt with on the national level and are everything, all the real the major decisions have been made by the local communities and by the prefectural governors. Nevertheless, uh, there can be a time of great aggression and great rancor within the diet as the government starts to use the power that it always has had since it got the uh, two-thirds majority two years ago to really start ramping things through. They have not exercised that during this uh, the time period. They've allowed discussion. They have allowed long periods of time to consider legislation, and they've also taken in uh, ideas from the outside. But the scenario three is the, the enemy of the people is, we'll do what we promise to do, whether the people like it or not. And the fourth is actually the worst scenario, where they do all three. In that case, if you're trying to say you're an international investor, there's nothing you can do, because you just don't know which Abe Shinzo will, will show up at the office <coughs> that day. And also, you, you can't predict which way anything will go. I, of course, would like number one to be the truth, the, the path, because I think that Japan's economy is the most important. Uh, complacency would be good, too. These would be terrible. And my hope, and most of people's hopes, are the first one. But don't count on number three. Uh, first of all, because of the April elections, 
but also because it's a fundamental problem in Japan. Job one is the one that people, well, most foreign journalists don't really get into. Some of them do, uh, and, and I salute them. Job one is revitalization of the regions. Uh, this map, I don't know if you've any of you have seen it, it's, it's called the Masada map uh, by Masada Hiroya, that's him there, and this is his report from May of last year, showed this country to the core. And what this map shows is, for the first time, effectively, how rural Japan is going to die. And it's going to die not from people dying off. No, it's going to die from women of childbearing ages disappearing from local communities. The Masada map, in this, this, in this map, they couldn't do any predictions about Fukushima, because they just said Fukushima with the nuclear issue is just too complicated. But for all these are all local communities. The, the white, I know it's difficult to see. Maybe I should do the other color. Maybe it'll be easier to see. There we go. Um, so the white communities are the, the safe communities. And the gray and the black are the ones that are in danger. Um, in these communities, by the year uh, 2040, there will be 50% fewer women of childbearing age, or more, more than 50% of women of childbearing age uh, than there are today. Uh, so for vast swaths of this country, uh, this island of Oak, this island will lose 90% of its women of childbearing age. This part of Tokyo will also lose 90% of its women of childbearing age. It's, a, it's an all-country problem. It's not the far places, it's the near places too. And all of these communities are in danger of serious collapse, basically because of the lack of children in them. Getting people to move, getting women to, to uh, bear children uh, is a difficult thing in a modern society because women are not just valuable as, to use a phrase that got a LDP prop, uh, politician in a great deal of trouble, baby-making machines. Now, for much of human history, that was indeed women's value, in many ways, at least for men. Uh, in a modern society, that's not the case, and then women's lives are not controlled by this. And Japan has not made a transition to a new kind of society in that regard. Getting to that society is Abe's job one. He's starting to realize it, and he certainly has pushed women as empowerment of women as an important issue for him personally. It's kind of odd because he and his wife do not have children. But he certainly has seen childbearing and women's empowerment as extremely important. And it's vitally important for the survival of these communities because these communities are, are destined to die without it. So what we're going to see, and the, in fact the only really detailed part of the Abe program, if you look at it, is this rural revitalization idea. They have actual goals. They have goals like by the year 2020, they want men, only 2% of men take paternity leave. They want the national standard to be 13%. Only about 39% of people take their college educations in the prefecture they grew up in. They want to raise that figure to 55%. They want to, they have actual numerical targets, actual numerical goals, which is completely different from the rest of the Abe program. Except, of course, for the 222 part. 2% 2 inflation, 2% 2 growth in two years, which we're not going to hit, as you may have noticed. Uh, that's the, for the general, but in terms of really planning for something, this is where it's going to, is, is happening. It just happens to be just before the local elections, so you can be cynical about it and say, oh, this is just for the local elections, after that they'll forget it. I, I put it to you possibly that this is actually Japan's job one. Um, is Abe Shinzo the right person to do it though? I have tremendous doubts. This is Yuya Township. This is where the Abe family comes from. This is a uh, scene at night, and these are terraced rice paddies. Uh, these are the lights of fishing vessels that are conveniently parked offshore uh, for the tourists to take pictures of. 
I'm going to read you a section from Abhishek's book of 2013. Those of you who read my blog and read my translation of this section, I'm going to read it to you anyway one more time. Once I wake this up. Um, hello, wrong bit. Here we go. Um, it's called Mizaho no Kuni. Mizaho no Kuni is a traditional name for Japan. Mizaho means the, uh, no Kuni being the land of rich rice plants. And uh, the section from the book is published in 2013 by him. He's only published one book, but he's published it twice. Um, this is the 2013 version of that first book. Um, it goes like this. This is a section on what he thinks Japan's economic reform should be. From ancient times unto the present, this country called Nippon. Oh, there goes the screen. Sorry, I'll try it again. Oh, I'm sorry. Forgive me one moment. Okay. It seems to have jumped. I beg your patience for one moment. There we go. This time I'm going to be very careful. One more time. Please consider the when we move this photograph. <laughs> From ancient times into the present, this country called Japan has been a place where one rises early in the morning and cultivates one's fields and rice paddies, sweat streaming. When the autumn comes, together with the imperial family at the center, we pray at the festival of the five grains. This is the Mizuhon. It is based upon self-reliance and self-help. If by some ill chance a person should fall ill, all of the inhabitants of a village would help out this ill person. This, from the ancient times unto the present, has been the social welfare system of the Yippon. It is bound up in the DNA of the Japanese people. I believe there is a capitalism of a Mizuhono Kuni that is appropriate for a Mizuhono Kuni. However, while having an emphasis on an economy where there is free competition, it is not the capitalism that takes as its motive force greed, the type that, that has emerged out of Wall Street to take the world by storm, emphasizing ethics and rules, Dogi. and with a sense of what real wealth is, a form of market-based ideology in the Misofono Kuni that is appropriate for the Misofono Kuni. The Abe family has its roots in Nagato City from long ago, the township of Yuya. There are terraced rice paddies there. They face the Sea of Japan, and when they are filled with water, in each one there is a reflection of the moon, the reflections of the lights in the distant fishing boats. It is so beautiful as to take one's breath. The labor productivity of terraced rice paddies is low. From the point of view of economic rationality, they are nonsense. But precisely because there are these terraced rice paddies, this is my ancestral home. Furthermore, because we have these rural vistas, is this not why a graceful and lovely Nippon exists? Amid a market-based ideology, tradition, culture, and regional difference can still be emphasized. I want to go forward thinking that there is a means to an economy appropriate to a Mizuhono I don't think that guy's gonna do agriculture reform really well. <laughs> or any other kind of reform having to do with economics. It's ahistorical, it's imaginary, it's beautiful, it's poetic, it's, it's great for tourism brochures, but it sure as hell doesn't affect reality as I know. So I have a great fear that that within the man itself, there is there's a there's a, 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 a vacuum in terms of realism. Now, this is my last slide from last year. 
uh, when Abe and Ike, his Ikenai program seemed unstoppable. So I portrayed him as, yes, a member of the Borg, and his all resistance is futile. I was pretty close to right in terms of the, of the election of last year. Uh, resistance was futile. They came out, the, the uh, coalition came out of the election with just as many seats as they went in, basically. It, was, it worked out. Uh, his clock is reset in terms of his term in office. His fellow uh, LDP members are extremely grateful, so he has no problems with the LDP presidential election in, in September. Uh, however, I was wrong also. Resistance did pay benefits. There was an ability to slow down the collective security decisions. There was no forward motion in terms of the nuclear reactor restarts. Those only happened just recently, and there's still just a piddly number of decisions have been made. So resistance is not futile. And in so, so I'm going to put it my last slide this time. Uh, a concept that I've been working on, which is, I don't know what Abishinzo is about to do. The farther we get away from the 2012 December election, which brought Abishinzo back to power, and which unified the LDP uh, in terms of getting back into power in ways that are really hard to fathom, unless you've been to Siberia for a long period of time, which is the way they felt, the, uh, the LDP. Uh, they really were unified, they were really together, they're all on one page. And you could really see that there was some kind of program. Now we've put into place all the simple, easy things in the economic program. The hard things are still left out. Uh, the, the, they've had two year, years of success. They might slow down, they might take it easy, who knows. But there's really no plan for the next two years aside from the rural revitalization plans. There's really no sense, I, in my view, of where he's going to go. And uh, so instead of uh, a Star Trek reference, I'm going to go a little bit farther back in time uh, to George Harrison, who my little guitarist and uh, the Beatles. Um, we had, as the uh, LDP slogan, Keiki no kaifuku kolomichi shikanai, or toward economic uh, revitalization, uh, recovery, this is the only path, kind of a, a, a creepy kind of image. Um, but you know, uplifting, he's got his face going on. And then I share the, uh, the wisdom of uh, a late life George Harrison, which is, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And I think that's basically where we stand in terms of the other revolution. It's all up in his head. Uh, we don't know where it's going, uh, but it's going to get there. Uh, <laughs> and when we're there, we'll know. And uh, that's the way I'm going to stop for today. And then uh, I look forward to your questions on all topics having to do with Japanese politics. Thank you. You should all uh, also look at uh, Michael's uh, blog, Kesaku, which will tell you everything you need about Japanese politics. Uh, now I was struck when you read this, with this wonderful voice, this translation of his uh, uh, thoughts on agriculture. And I think really, I, I don't know if the Conte has an English language spokesman, but I think you should consider applying. <laughs> because it was actually, it was much more charismatic than when the Prime Minister speaks. Uh, it's it's not a Japanese thing. It's a typical conservative Western European, or you know, to some extent American view of the idealization of rurality. You know, the, the countryside is noble, the cities corrupt. Uh, there's nothing Japanese in mean, it's traditional reactionary Western thinking. Uh, <laughs> so it's actually not from Japan. It's an import from the West. Uh, but um, having made this na this comment, I will uh, let you take questions. Um, so speak up or all your peace forever. Uh, no one is not a very shy group, I assume. Okay, so and then you'll get a mic. And okay, the mics will be distributed. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shustola. This is my uh, let me quickly share. Could, could you identify yourself and uh, 
speak slowly. I have a five here. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, the shoes of business now. Okay. And, uh, let me quickly share my view and then ask you a question. My, uh, I, I'm feeling the possibility that uh, our Prime Minister Abe is the first out of the second arrow will fail. Uh, I'm not like convinced. I'm not saying that we, it must fail, but it may or may not fail. Then, if, if it happens, uh, there will be a situation that uh, technically uh, Prime Minister Abe has his political, um, let's say, uh, position or seat as a Prime Minister, but uh, he will become Labour. Um, after uh, executing general election, his position is guaranteed, but his uh, political influence will, uh, uh, will, will, uh, will be lost. So if that happens, uh, if, that, if it comes to that situation, what will happen in LDP or uh, uh, whatever? I'd like to hear your view. Um, I agree that there is a possibility that there are structural difficulties in Japan that make it, that, um, make it uh, impossible for uh, the just throw money at it uh, solution to work. It is possible that that is the case. Uh, one would hope that it isn't because Japan is the test case for the world of this concept. Um, that's the reason why Paul Krugman comes here to tell Abe, don't do the consumption tax because your program is the one that everybody else is going to be modeled after and if you blow it, then none of the Western countries are going to engage in economic reforms that they need to, and more likely will get benefits from, than Japan. Um, of course, if it doesn't work, if the economy stagnates and, or, or goes into recession long term, he's gone. The, uh, the LDP is like any organization, it rejects the failures, uh, and he will be seen as a failure. Uh, I assume that he understands that uh, economic reform and economic performance are extremely important. He indeed talks about it a great deal. Uh, whether he has uh, the ability uh, to do anything about it is set up both by these structural problems and also what, by one other aspect which I haven't talked about, which is the cronyism that is very clearly uh, a part of obvious economic uh, planning and e economic uh, decision making. He relies tremendously on a, a small group of friends and a small group of industrialists, uh, Toyota Akio, Toyota Motors, uh, Hasegawa of Takeda Pharmaceuticals, who's also the head of the case I go Yukai. Um, and then things happen in the Abe administration that just, just seem too coincidental. Uh, Ebola breaks out and Fujifilm has an antiviral drug that the Japanese government will present. It just so happens that Komori Shigetaka is one of Abe's most common golf partners. Um, these things, there's, there is a cronyist aspect to that uh, a lot of people don't want to talk about because then people will start bailing out of Japanese stocks immediately. Uh, but that also might have played a part. Anyway, if the economy tanks, he's gone. That's true for any Japanese prime minister. Nobody can survive that. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Dave, and I'm a comedian. Uh, I'm not going to ask anything very funny. I'm sorry. Um, and you mentioned it coming up in August because of the 70th anniversary, there's going to be a new statement. And you said that currently they're already trying to find all exactly the right words. And I'm wondering what they're hoping to achieve by meticulously crafting words. Uh, won't it basically be the same as, I think it's the Kono statement is the, the big one? I'm not sure if you have any more. No? It's the, it's the Murayama statement. But Murayama says, thank you. Um, won't it just be the same kind of process of an apology that is viewed by China and Korea as being somewhat insufficient, you know, slightly lacking in sincerity? They'll complain. Uh, Japan says, no, we've apologized many times. There'll be a little bit of um, you know, back and forth in that, and then it'll just sort of continue on as it always has. Or will all this meticulous planning they do 
Are there going to be any differences at all, or can we expect any kind of change in that on that ground? If you would ask me on December the 31st, I would say uh, that the Chinese and the South Koreans would be upset with anything that Abe did, and Abe would feel resentful toward them, etc. However, we got past on December 23rd, and December, I mean, December 31st, and that was a really important day. It meant that in a, in a calendar year, Abe Shinzo had not officially gone to Yeskin. That having not happened, at least that we know about, <laughs> uh, is huge. That means that this administration really cares about getting it right. And even though they dragged the Kono and the people who worked with Kono in crafting the Kono Statement on the Comfort Women over the coals for their co collaboration with South Korean authorities to get the language right on that one, they have no choice but to do the same thing with the Chinese and South Koreans this time in terms of the 7th anniversary. And until December the 31st, I didn't think that was possible. Now, as regards to my odd comment uh, regarding Yasukuni visit, uh, Abe officially hasn't gone. This does not mean that he hasn't gone. Now, uh, we know that Shimomura uh, Hakabun, the uh, Minister of Education, paid a secret visit which he later revealed. Whether that was indeed a test run of a, a secret Abe visit to Yasukuni or not, I don't know, but, it turned, but effectively it was one. And Hakabun uh, Shimomura was able to do that. Uh, but in terms of the public world that we live in, that we know about, things that we, we, have, we have seen and heard, this is huge that he can us. And uh, it works very well. And the Chinese response has been relatively, uh, has been relatively open. And there are seemingly good uh, contacts that are going on. So my sense is that if this, the South Koreans and the Chinese can be happy with what's uh, said, I think the whole world would be happy with what we've learned. There's, 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 no, there's no really, there's no, there are no tougher critics in that. My name is Peter Smith. My, I was interested during your talk, you never mentioned the Constitution. And I wondered whether you had any thoughts on how he might approach trying to do something as the elections next year for the House of Councillors come up, and whether he will make it an issue, or whether he will try to ignore it. The constitutional revision uh, it has been a part of the LDP's uh, policy manifesto, if you can call it that, then, since its founding in 1955. Abe Shinzo, therefore, can uh, say, I'm doing constitutional revision as an LDP leader. Uh, without bringing up all the baggage of his own life <coughs> prior to the uh, And they will pursue it. Uh, it will not, however, uh, unless they want humiliation, be pursued with any seriousness. At uh, least, they don't have the numbers in the House of Counselors. Uh, and uh, even if they had the numbers in the House of Counselors, the, the, the numbers for a, a national referendum look terrible. Uh, and They'd also have to clear everything with the new Cometo uh, to get toward constitutional revision. The, uh, the allies that Abe had, his good friend Hiran uh, uh party evaporated from 19, I'm sorry, 20 to 2 uh, in the latest election. He has to, in order to be Abe Shinzo and be the Prime Minister of the LDP, the president of the LDP, he has to talk about this provision. But seriously, doing something about it, even in the move toward the election, is not I think, reasonably intelligent. But sometimes unreasonable things happen. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Anton Roth. I'm a PhD student at the University of Tokyo, and I have a question about the nuclear, uh, uh, the nuclear issue, if you wish, it's okay to come back to this. Uh, first, actually, it's two questions. So first, 
you said that uh, now everything is happening at the local level from now on. So what can Abe do and what will Abe do? Because he still says that it's one of his priorities. So what can he do? And the second part of my question is about the opposition to the nuclear issue. As you said, uh, the Japanese public is definitely against it, but also not, you know, it's not really in, in, uh, in the Japanese fashion to go down to the, in the street in great numbers and, and demonstrate about it. So what kind of opposition w uh, is actually taking place or will take place, and also politically in the diet, um, what kind of dynamics con uh, concerning this issue do you see? Thank you. What I can do is talk very uh, sensibly about uh, nuclear power. The, the LDP as a whole uh, has to do a uh, retooling of its message. Its message was Japan's uh, capital account and Japan's uh, trade balance is being ruined by the lack of reactors being on. That in terms of its natural gas imports for power generation and its bunker oil imports in terms of, of uh, power generation and coal, of course, uh, this increase in the use of fossil fuels was ruining Japan. Well, the, the collapse in oil prices has really uh, gutted that uh, argument. So they have to re revamp it. They do have an argument that Japan should have a mixed uh, kind of uh, energy uh, energy base. But even in their uh, heyday when oil prices were very high, uh, they weren't able to come to some kind of decision what that base load should be comprised of. They weren't even willing to commit to that. Uh, now they have this period of readjustment where they have to rethink, okay, what's the arguments for and against? And the schedule for restarts is really lackadaisical. It's, it's you know, the, the, the Takahama to come on in six months' time is really, really, really uh, slow. But that's the prediction that most political analysts are looking at. Uh, if prices for oil go up, there will be an accelerated uh, change. What can Abe do? Uh, he probably would not want to do very much. He really would want the local communities to decide. And it is really up to the, the, of course, the mayors of the local towns, in the most part, are all pro-nuclear. Uh, many of these towns, as uh, Daniel Aldrich's research has shown, were specially selected for, one, <coughs> having no economy, and two, having very, very weak social bonds so that they're unable to organize themselves coherently internally. That's, that's Daniel Aldrich's uh, site fights. Uh, uh, These communities will go for it, the prefectural assemblies will go for it, and then most likely the governors will go for it too. Saga is the test case. And if the Saga gubernatorial election goes in a way that, it, that is not conducive to uh, nuclear research, then we're talking about a, new, a really new, new ball game.
terms of in terms of economic reform, um, Abe may not personally be an extremely bright individual, um, <laughs> but he has a lot of really smart people that he listens to, um, and uh, a lot is riding on the success of Japan's economic reforms, so that it's a transnational issue. Uh, so you have people like Adam Posen, former bank governor of England. Chiming in on how everything obviously doing is great. Um, you have Krugman, you have, um, I, I guess, uh, DeLong at Berkeley. Um, <coughs> he really needs to get it right because paying for any of his uh, national po power uh, policies uh, is going to be expensive. They are doing some fiddles. I don't know if you get the Tokyo Shimbun, but uh, they had a, a great time with noticing that the uh, supplementary budget for, for economic uh, stimulus had increasing levels of defense spending in it each year, and now is 6% of the uh, supplementary budget, uh, which is much more than the national budget. Uh, it's really very interesting there. But those fiddles have a limit. They, they can't get away with everything forever. They do indeed need a growing economy uh, to pay for the national power issues. Because Japan is, cannot move from where it's, it is. It has a very large neighbor that is growing incredibly powerful, which has a very strange political system. And uh, unfortunately, at the same time, a very, very aggressive uh, anti-Japanese ideology uh, in, inculcated, uh, which, of course, we're not all prisoners of ideology. But nevertheless, it, it offers uh, people excuses for action that might not be very good. Uh, I think he's serious about economic reform. I just think he doesn't, he, I mean, you saw the list in last year, it was 230 third arrow reforms, or something more than that. And it was described, uh, I think he might, I don't know if it was by Jesper Cole, or if, if Jeff, Jesper wants to, to kill me for this, that's okay. Um, that it was described as a um, venture fund of policies, where you would have 60% of them would fail, 30% would be okay, and then 10% would be real winners. You can't run policy like that. <laughs> Nobody can do that. Uh, but that was, you know, when you have 230 options, and some of them may work and some of them don't, and you may have also recalled that the last third era reforms didn't have um, goals, percentages, numbers, how much is this going to change GDP, how much is this going to affect it, nothing. It's just good ideas, these might be good ideas. Um, I would see in that case, yeah, they're not serious. Maybe they'll be serious this time, and I hope they'll have a very short list of things to do in June, but uh, we'll see. Uh, the second question. Regarding the leadership election of the, the DPJ. Anyone would be better than Kaida Dandi, so that's a start. Um, and uh, the three gentlemen, uh, I'm really sad that uh, Ren Ho dropped out. Uh, she would have really taken the fight to Mr. Abe. It would have been really wonderful to watch budget committee uh, interpolations. It would have been great, but it's not going to happen. Uh, Any one of the three are competent. Uh, they're unfortunately all infected with the DPJ's most serious disease, which is seriousness. <laughs> <laughs> they are deadly serious. And one of the things that, that allowed Koizumi to dance all over them was the fact that he had enjoyed life and made sure that life was a party. And it turns out that Japanese are not really turned on by seriousness as much as the DPJ thinks. <laughs> <laughs> That's my view of what's going to happen. If, if Okada might have learned from 2005, when he got absolutely waxed by Koizumi, that if you drive up in a white Toyota Corolla and ask them to come in and you're gripping the, the steering wheel with white knuckles and saying, I'm a very safe driver. <laughs> you can trust me, but it's possible that neither of us are going to have a good time. <laughs> that people are not going to get into that car, but instead are going to get into Koizumi's red Ferrari. <laughs> Maybe he learned from that. I hope he did, because it would be great. It would be great to have a, a, a revived two-party system. 
uh, the, currently the system, and it's really interesting for me, is that the domination of the LDP over other parties is reflected within the LDP of the domination of the now Hosada faction over all the other factions. We have this, these two very, very similar situations. Within the LDP itself, they have one super faction, the, the Hosada faction, it was the Machimura faction, but Abe doesn't like any rivals, and, and Machimura ran against Abe in 2012, so he's kicked upstairs to the Speaker of the House position. Hosada takes over. They're huge. And then the others are, there are two medium-sized ones, and then there are lots of little ones. And it's exactly like the political system on the exterior. Uh, maybe this is the Japanese way. I hope it isn't. I hope we can have a two-party a two system, because then we can have some real fights in the, in the, in the diet, and I love watching those. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I have another question. Uh, first, about, uh, I'm sorry, but for the nuclear issue, you didn't uh, res uh, answer the part about the opposition to the nuclear power and what kind of uh, shape it will take. And I'm just taking a chance to take another, uh, to ask another question. I read uh, an article by Gerald Carl Curtis on the East Asia Forum about the prospect for the Japanese political system. And he was really pessimistic, saying that uh, it's basically back to the 55 system without a strong opposition uh, at all, like, so that there was no place at the moment for uh, opposition in the political system and that the LDP would be dominant for the foreseeable future. So I was wondering what you think about this analysis and what do you think are the chances for the opposition to kind of rebound and get it stuck together? In terms of the nuclear uh, issue, uh, the most recent you get all asked um, uh, where uh, Abe's support, uh, the support for the Abe cabinet was 51%, and which was nine points up before uh, from what it was in December, and the do not support was 36%, which was three points down. In that poll, they asked the question, uh, uh, do you see it as important that we go forward uh, with the reactor restarts, 33% uh, said it's important to go forward, and 55% of respondents said there is uh, no need to proceed with any dispatch. Um, that's again the Nikkei poll of, of last year, I think the December, oh, here it's December 25th to 26th. Um, so 55%, that's, that's pretty significant, considering that cabinet support is 51%. Um, the, the way that the uh, protest movement can make any changes is not by making noise in front of the content, though it's great that they do that. Um, it's good to have a vocal uh, protest movement, even a small one. Uh, nevertheless, the, the action's at the local level. Uh, and gubernatorial uh, elections will be large in this process, but for the most part, the nuclear reactors are located in places where people like having nuclear reactors. Uh, not near population centers, uh, where there is usually not much going on other than the nuclear reactor itself. So, uh, uh, if, I, I think the other administration is right, if under these new, much stricter uh, safety guidelines, these plants can be operated. They were operated safely before. They were nuclear accidents, mostly having to do with plutonium reprocessing. Uh, and uh, there were some earthquake-related accidents, such as the Kashiwazaki uh, reactors being knocked offline by the Niigata earthquake. But for the most part, Japan was quite comfortable with this. Uh, and if indeed the, the, the standards are much higher, well, it's a trade-off. Being, uh, I'm not sure that uh, being in a, in more and more dependent on uh, Russian gas and Russian oil would be really be conducive to Japan's greater security. Um, as regards as regards the, the, the Curtis analysis, um, not many people know this, but when the DPJ took power in 2009. Uh, the person who went on television for the midnight lecture uh, to tell Japan what had happened was not a Japanese citizen. It was Gerald Curtis, speaking Japanese for about 15 minutes. 
uh, he delivered a beautiful speech about the amazing thing that the Japanese people had just done by throwing out the LDP. So if Dr. Curtis is emotionally invested in the two-party system and feels really hurt by it, I entirely, I, I have, I entirely understand it. Um, my sense is that there's a bit of romanticism about the medium-sized districts uh, in some older academics. Uh, I think that when you have 10 to 12 percent economic growth, uh, that covers a lot of sins. And it wasn't necessarily the electoral system that was generating a lot of good feelings and cooperation between the socialists and everybody. There was a lot of money to share. That hasn't been the case in the entire time that the single member districts have been present. As a consequence, uh, the, there was, of course, in the Japanese people, and this is, this is a private, not well-researched thought of mine, um, there was a sense for about 30 years, from about the 89 with the Takeshita uh, premiership and the Sadawa Kyuubi scandals, that it was time to get rid of the LDP. And it became a national project. And the person who worked most with that national project was Ozawa Ichiro, which made it kind of an iffy project at that point, because he had his own personal baggage with him. But he was the one who introduced the single member districts. A lot of the changes within the LDP that made the party more centralized, made the factions less important, <coughs> he did. Uh, he, of course, created party after party after party and eventually engineered the 2009 electoral victory uh, by borrowing a lot of LDP ideas along the way. Um, that all culminated in 2009 with finally getting rid of the LDP. And there was a long time the sense that if we could get the politics of Japan right, everything else would fall into place. The Japan's place in the world, Japan's economy, all these things could be fixed. It's just the politics. So the LDP is thrown out. And things didn't get better. And so what's the project now? That, I think, also, in addition to Kaeda Banbi's uh, leadership, and he was chosen, basically, to, to fail. Uh, no, he was, because the, the, I think that they, the, uh, the, what they're called the Gang of Six, within the, the, the six members, which uh, Noda, Hosono, Edano, Okada, and one more. Maihara, right. These, these guys got together and said, okay, we'll, we'll have Kaida in place, and after the 2013 elections, when we'll lose, he'll resign to take responsibility, and one of us will become the new leader. And he didn't resign. <laughs> he couldn't even get failure right. <laughs> so, when that happened, they suddenly had this guy who was there, and they tried to get rid of him this summer again. They tried to convince him to push forward the leadership election so they could get rid of him. <laughs> Um, Abe did that for me. Uh, so we, we have that situation. Uh, but that's only half of it. Half of it, I think, is the people just don't see, are not convinced that politics necessarily is going to solve things. But there is a light in the, at the end of the tunnel for the DPJ. Uh, in that same Nikkei poll that I've said, they asked the question, why do you think the uh, Abe administration and the Kogito won so many seats? 11% of the people said, because the, Abe, the, the, the people think the Abe administration is good. 85% said, is because there was no political party available that would be able to confront the LDP. If you can create a party, it doesn't have to have you know, candidates in every district, but that is able to confront the LDP and make a credible case for that. There's, there, there's, a, there's a green field there. And yeah, a lot of people didn't show up to vote. Those people will come back, or at least some part of them. We've lost so many since 2009, that election, where 70 million people showed up. We didn't, we, we, we didn't we, we got 50 million, you know. Um, there's a lot of ground that can be made up there.
Michael, uh, it's Tom, Tom and Sullivan. Um, you, you, um, you mentioned the budget briefly there, and it's, I guess it's going to be approved on January 14th, the government's uh, budget, uh, which is next week. Uh, I was just wondering if you had looked at some of the numbers contained in the budget and whether it kind of sig signaled any, any uh, um, messages in terms of Abe's future. I, I noticed the taxation number, for instance, is a 24-year high. They're budgeting 54 trillion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. trillion uh, of tax uh, in income revenues uh, right. this coming nice. year, which appears to be very very high, given that the consumption tax has been deferred, and um, presumably it's going to come mainly from corporation taxes. But I was just wondering if you've, if you've looked at those numbers and... Uh, and well, uh, okay, the, the, the co you, it's good that you, you brought up the, the, the corporate revenue, because uh, um, you know, economists like Ikeda Nobu uh, see it as only fair. Uh, the rest of us were impoverished by the devaluation of the currency. It's only fair that the uh, people who really made a lot of money out of it, which were the corporates that uh, get their, rec their receipts in dollars and then convert them into to yen, uh, that they pay more. Unfortunately, the what, what the Abe administration decided last in the last year was to further reduce the effective corporate tax rate. That's something that the DBJ did, by the way. Uh, they were, the, the corporate tax rate on the DBJ in its last year was 40.61% effective corporate tax rate in Tokyo. Um, they reduced it. And again in 2012 and in 2013, the Abe administration reduced it. I don't know, so 2013, 2014, the Abe reduced, administration reduced it. They'll reduce it again this year. So those revenues will go down. Um, in terms of the budget, uh, it's still, it, it, it's better. Uh, in terms of its economic health, but still nearly half of it is, is done on bonds. Uh, and uh, it, they, there's that incredible resistance to clearing over the uh, 100 trillion mark. They just don't want to do it. Uh, that's really, that's kind of odd. Uh, if you're really serious about it, it, that shouldn't be some kind of psychological barrier. But there are psychological barriers. The 100 trillion mark, the 1% uh, of, of uh, of uh, um, GDP in terms of defense spending, that uh, so that's not a re necessarily a rational process. I don't really have much to say about the rest of the budget numbers. I haven't looked at them. Thank you for your, my apologies, <coughs> your speech so far. My name is uh, Hans van der Pan. I have uh, a few business things of income. I'm also the, chamber, uh, the chairman of the Netherlands Chamber of Commerce. And I have a question to you about the media. Um, about 25 years ago, Karl von Wolfgang uh, wrote the book, The Ekema, Japanese Power. You may agree that his message was, in Japan, uh, nothing much will change. Do you agree with that over the last 25 years? Although there have been changes, but are there, is there anything major change? Uh, are you talking about the media environment? Or? Yeah, the media. And how do the, what is the role of the media in relation to Abe and the support he gets from the media? Is there really independent media to criticize you? Um, okay, I'm going to, uh, if anybody else has an opinion, in particular members of the press, Japanese press are here, I'd like to hear it. Um, my sense is, and I'm, I'm speaking with someone who's been here for 20 years, uh, who also, I used to work for TV Asahi in their New York bureau office. Um, my sense is that Japan is one of the finest uh, news development and uh, dissemination uh, systems in the world, that there is a vast difference between the way a Yomi Shimbun would have reported a story regarding Abe and the way that a uh, Asahi Shimbun would report it, the way that the Nikkei would report it, the way that the Tokyo Shimbun, my hometown newspaper, would report it. They are vastly different. They focus on different issues. Yes, they're all in the Kisha Club together, but they all have agendas. and you. If you've been here long enough, you can see what the agendas are. But sometimes they change. The agenda at the Mayanichi Shinbun, for example. Well, Mayanichi has gone from, during the DPJ, uh, a, a fellow traveler of the Yomiuri Shinbun, all the way now is 
possibly farther left than the, clearly farther left than the, the Asahi, and it's getting close to the Tokyo Shinbun in terms of its critique of uh, Shinzo Abe. Uh, it's the only, for example, it's gone out on a limb and said that Japan should abandon its pelagic whaling system, uh, program, because it's stupid. Um, wow, a Japanese media organization saying that this is stupid in terms of international politics. Uh, there is variety, there is change, and uh, I would much rather, if I were lost in, in some place, I maybe, uh, no, I would be happiest with a Japanese newspaper if I had to spend it a long period of time sitting down somewhere. Uh, there are, of course, Western publications, and I won't say your names because I want to be all friends with all of you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in general, uh, in terms of the, the, the factual level, and, and, and if you've been in a country long enough, um, well, I, I've been here 20 years, this is a short term, I know. But uh, you know what the rest of the story is. So you only need the details that they've provided, and then you can say, yes, and I know that in the past this happened. So it's not in the story now, and perhaps for a person who's coming newly to the country, the, the, the writing is fair, but there's so much stuff that's in your head that's not on the page that allows you to take what's there and absorb it. That's my, that's my, that's my view. If there are any members of the Japanese press who wish to defend themselves, please. Um, uh, last time I made a terrible mistake and, and criticized a particular Japanese organization. Not criticized, but pointed out its possible weaknesses, and its chief editor was here. with Japanese media is the English media is very weak here in Japan. English media is very weak. And so in a way, um, sometimes you know, Japanese media become very nationalistic. Um, and, um, well, nationalism is related to issues. And particularly political news reports um, uh, have that kind of tendency. That's one of the problems. And so uh, Japanese media are not exposed to international criticism and so forth. That's one problem. And uh, I have a question about uh, Japanese politics because you, know, you have been observing Japanese politics in the years. And, and so uh, why, I, my, my question is, why uh, liberals in the NDP are so weak now? And uh, what's the background? And a lot of liberals are asking themselves and, uh, the same kind of question, but uh, they can't uh, come up with the answer. Professor Eiji Yoshimasa, he said, kind of, uh, he, he used to be thought to be a kind of rising star. Mm -hmm. And Nukaba is not really uh, uh, fresh, but still he's a decent mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. But those people uh, look powerless mm -hmm. these days. And why do you think that happened? That happened? <laughs> Uh, that's a really huge question. Uh, no, it really is. And, 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 and I, 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 I don't want to say anything really shallow about it. Uh, it has uh, a lot to do, I think, with okay, the, uh, the centralization of the LDP's power structure, uh, the, uh, especially the uh, concentration of financing into the hands of the Secretary General. Uh, that uh, reform, which was supposed to increase party discipline, has succeeded. Party is more, more disciplined. It just means that there are more, the liberals die out and instead are replaced by uh, more ideologically uh, aligned along the Machinura faction, which has been the dominant faction since Obuchi's death. Uh, that, that what used to be the anti-mainstream. That's the great thing. The liberals used to be the mainstream in the LDP, and the, the Machinura, what before the which is originally the Fukuda faction, was the anti-mainstream. Well, they've been in charge since, since uh, Mori. 
uh, and uh, then really hit their stride with Koizumi, and then came, then came Abe, and then came Fukuda, Fukuda too. Um, and now we have Abe again. Um, with that, those reforms to uh, strengthen the party like uh, secretariat uh, came uh, ideological same or something. Uh, also, uh, a lot of the present party, uh, they're just simply outnumbered by all these youngsters who grew up in a uh, much more um, aggressively either revisionist or um, nationalist atmosphere within conservative circles. Uh, uh, and uh, there is a certain attraction, of course, uh, to that kind of ideological <coughs> same as uh, when the economy is bad. Uh, because the, the basic deal that Yoshida Shigeru offered the Japanese people back in the, in the 40s and 50s was, we'll stay out of international politics, we'll stay out of the military, we'll, and in return, we'll become wealthy. And that trade-off still, still rings in Japanese life. But we have so many counterexamples now. The South Koreans. you telling me that they stayed out of military life? The Chinese. All these countries have taken off while still being great military powers and now are threatening Japan. At that point, it gets very, very hard to defend the liberal uh, argument that Yoshida Shige gave that there's a trade-off between military power and liberal society and economics. And we'll go on the liberal society and economics. That trade-off doesn't necessarily exist uh, anymore. And uh, so the argument that we have to protect ourselves, we have to hunger down and be, be prepared, uh, becomes uh, increasingly attractive, I think. But that's just wild speculation on my part. Uh, that, that, that has to be numbered up. Okay. So Michael, thank you for an excellent presentation. I'm John West, as you know. I didn't fully really understand, I don't think, your uh, comments on uh, General Curtis, but were you trying to suggest that Japan is basically unreformable? No, I think, I think that um, we hit a bad spell. And there was, indeed, a, a period of time where uh, the DPJ in particular uh, felt that it had achieved a great victory. But it actually, actually it was a victory of the people. And Gerald Curtis's analysis the eat on the, uh, after the election of 2009 was straight on. It was something that the people had achieved. It wasn't something that Ozawa had achieved. It wasn't something even that Khan, or, or definitely not, his founder, Hatoyama, had it, she had it. Uh, this was a, a, a national problem. Uh, so, and, and the people of FIFA are not engaged now, as we saw by the numbers in the, uh, in the election. The number of people, the, the voting rate was the lowest in history, and it was seven point percentage points down. J Japanese elections in the House of Representatives had hit the 59% level three times, but had never fallen below that before. So this is really a historical uh, negative on Abe's future legacy, that uh, he, he came into power with the 59% people showing up at the polls, and he retained power with 52%. You know, he demoralized the people, uh, can, is, a, is a fair accusation, um, or the situation demoralized the people. If you can offer a dream. If you can offer a program, not just what the DBT has been doing, which is putzing around with ideas that it was using in 2003, um, but something that is coherent for the now, in the post-2008 global financial crisis environment, which they haven't done. Um, to a certain extent, the Japan Innovation Party is doing that. Um, and it has uh, some expansionist economic ideas and it has some contraction of economic ideas in it. If you have a vision, and it, you'll have to borrow a lot from the LDP, uh, there is a demoralized, currently demoralized and currently uninvolved electorate 
that you can win. And the great thing is, if you look at the elections, the last uh, election since 2005, they were all landslides. Okay? And they were the la landslides for the people who offered economic opportunity. And in this last election, well, let's go back to the 2009 election. The LDP got wiped out in 2009 with far fewer votes than it received in wiping out the, the DPJ in 2012. What had happened? 10 million people hadn't showed up. When the voting rate had dropped. Like 10 million people simply did not show up to vote. If you can get those 10 million people back in, you can have a landslide go in your direction. And that's basically what the, uh, and then you have a two-party system and maybe more lively debates and more interesting ideas. Uh, and my personal view is there would be someone to fight against L I obvious cronies, but don't, don't say that too loudly because that will depress uh, international investors. <laughs> Just one very short comment. You raise your hand, so we will. <coughs> Gravity is a sort of wit. So. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Yukio Kashiyama, uh, Japanese newspaper Sunday. I'm a chief editorial writer. There you are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said something very naughty about the San Kishino last year. Yeah, so <laughs> this gentleman said that. That's okay. I, I, I appreciate you. I'll give you a chance to explain our position about the secret law. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, I, your address is uh, about the Japanese media, very interesting. My question is different. Uh, it's uh, regarding the Senkaku Island. A high rank official of the state, including President Obama, have stated and over and over that the, uh, the Security treaty between Japan and the United States and, uh, is applicable to the Senkaku Island. But uh, they said that um, uh, in regarding with the sovereignty, they don't have any specific position. It sounds very strange for me. Well, well if it's uh, uh, applicable, why they say, oh, that is the Japanese territory? Why they don't say that? Because, as uh, you know, that shortly after the World War II, the United States state in a metal line uh, which defined the territory of J in Japan, that including the single Island. So I am wondering what I hope for the United States to make it clear that the uh, single to the Japanese territory. How do you think? I'll answer that as in, in, a, in an unfortunately brief way because we don't we run out of time. And, uh, <coughs> You have the, the person to ask is Richard Nixon. Um, <laughs> it was his decision. Um, and he made that decision, the, the language, the way it was decided. And maybe, maybe the Henry the K, you could probably ask him, he's still with us. Um, you ask him and he'll say, well, in, in, uh, at the time the decision was made, the United States recognized another China as being China. And that other China was our ally. And so the sovereignty issue was left open because otherwise the people from Taipei would start jumping up and down. But the Chinese in Beijing uh, took advantage of that situation that was created by the Nixon administration. That's all. Uh, I do have one observation, and this is entirely, um, it's up to you to think what, what I think about this. But uh, I was told that uh, this evening, uh, the Prime Minister went to the Embassy of France uh, to offer his condolences uh, for the journalists who were killed in the uh, Charlie Hebdo uh, murders in Paris. At the same time, this afternoon, at the FCCJ, was uh, Professor Guerrero from the University in Hokkaido, a former uh, Asahi Shimbun reporter, whose articles, including um, information by a certain infamous Yoshida Seiji, uh, led the Asahi Shimbun this year to apologize uh, for having printed false stories about the comfort women. Um, 
a uh, situation that has led the Abe administration to fiercely and uh, perhaps unwisely criticize the Asahi Shin uh, and led to death threats against Uemura, bomb threats against the university, uh, and uh, demands on Facebook that the children, to the children of uh, Mr. Uemura, that they commit suicide for the dishonor that their father has brought upon them. I find it really an interesting coincidence that these two events have occurred simultaneously today. I leave you with that. In that term, if, if you, I would find Mr. Abe's behavior both laudable and extremely hypocritical. Uh, I would hope that he would give a call to Mr. Goodman and say, sorry. That's all.